Sundays where you think, man, we have so many folks who I know are going to be out of town or who are sick. I don't know if we're going to have more than half a dozen people at church. And then we end up with folks who came in this morning, folks who are visiting with us this morning. If you see an unfamiliar face, make sure that you shake hands with them this morning. I'm not going to ask anybody to stand up or introduce yourself or anything like that. But uh, certainly, if you see an unfamiliar face, make sure that you shake a hand this morning. But we are glad that you are here. We're going to talk in just a little bit about those who aren't here this morning, some who are traveling, many who are sick, and so we're certainly going to be praying for them. But this morning, before we get started, we do have some announcements to go through. Uh, We've been announcing it for weeks, maybe longer than that, but it is camp time. So here we are, the day of camp. We leave this afternoon for camp. I know that at least one new camper is with us this morning. Knox, are you excited about that? You're excited about being in junior camp. You see, I say new camper, but really he's kind of cheating because he and his sister have been at camp since. Rebirth. Yeah, since <laughs> before they were born. So there you go. But in fact, I believe that there was a whole new section of camp that was invented just for these guys and a few others uh, known as baby camp. No more baby camp, though, right? This is actual real life junior camp. You get me all week long. (laughs) He might not have known that. Now he's thinking of backing out of camp, possibly. Anyway, it is camp. Uh, We have 17 uh, campers who are going, seven seven adults who are going. Um, We have the van loaded down. We have a truck loaded down. We have the possibility of taking uh, some folks in other vehicles But I tell you that to tell you this, in classic Arthur Cackley, classic Arthur Cackley move there, pray for us. That's what I'm getting to. Not just for those of us who are going, those of us who who are going to be responsible for these young folks this week. Certainly pray for us as we're teaching and preaching and, and being witnesses. But pray for, specifically today, pray for safety as we're going down. I know some parts... Uh, Some of the churches coming from different parts of the state are driving through some rain today, so be in prayer for them as they go down. The rain is predicted, I believe, for all week long. Uh, I've had several folks who have already mentioned that to me. Uh, Yeah, even when it's not raining, it's going to feel like it's raining. Those of us who have been at camp before know that it's not unusual to have 75 to 80 percent humidity in the mornings while we're down there. Uh, uh, Ralph, who grew up in southeast Texas, is going, ah, that's nothing. 80% humidity, that's a dry day. But my point is this, uh, it's a long week, it's a tiring week, but what an incredible opportunity it is uh, to be able to to meet, to be able to to form relationships with, to be able to, to grow in a deeper understanding of God, to know and understand some sometimes for the first time that God is that God cares about those campers. And that God desires to have a relationship with each of those campers. What an incredible opportunity it is for us this week uh, to be able to do that. Please, please, please pray for us this next week as often as God brings you to mind. Uh, We will have no activities. Our Wednesday night activities this week have been canceled. Um, Everybody, most everybody who's here on Wednesday night is going to be at camp. So uh, uh, at least half of them. So uh, I, I told the Wednesday night group last week, make sure that if you're thinking about, oh, it's Wednesday night, I'm supposed to be at camp. I said, just take that as an opportunity to be in prayer for those who are at camp. Uh, but no activities this Wednesday night. Following week, the week after camp, though, everything gets back to normal for the most part. Uh, board meeting is Tuesday, June the 13th, 7 p.m., right over here. And then the following Following the same week of the board meeting there, June the 17th, is men's prayer breakfast. That's pushing men's prayer breakfast back a week uh, to uh, June 17th at 7.30. And then uh, two weeks after we get back from camp is Vacation Bible School, Saturday, June the 24th. That's from 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. 
uh, just over here at Robinson Primary School grounds. So we are excited about the things that are coming up throughout the month of June. It's, uh, as most of Junes are, it's busy. We try to cram everything into about six weeks. Uh, all of our summer activities ha that used to be spread over three months now get crammed into about six weeks. And so absolutely, there's a lot of stuff for you to be involved in, for you to find ways to, uh, to help out, to support, whatever it is. So those things are all coming up. On also, June the 24th at 6 p.m., uh, we have our next family movie night, and that's going to be here in the Fellowship Hall, and we are going to watch Esther. I believe that's the, the plan, so uh, I know most of us have never seen that before. I know that's one of the ones that, uh, that our family had really wanted to watch, so we are, are absolutely looking forward to that on June the 24th. I know you're going to be, a lot of you are going to be tired and hot and, and worn out from doing vacation Bible school that day. If you fall asleep, it's okay. All we're going to do is take pictures and post you on the church website, on the church website or the Facebook page. So, you know, there you go. There you go. Cameron's on board with that. So, and she's laughing that she thinks if anybody thinks that I'm going to do that, because there you go. As uh, as usual, I want to mention to you the offering basket is at the back of the foyer this morning. Thank you for your continued support for all of the ways that you continue to to give and to faithfully give to the uh, the work of our local church in our community and beyond. Uh, usually, John, uh, this, this week, John would have given us a, uh, an update on what went on with the food pantry yesterday, but uh, Lily is sick, and so John and, and Lily are both out this morning. So uh, hopefully we'll get a report from them soon about the food pantry. I know last month uh, it was more than 1,000 individuals, I think more than 1,100 individuals actually last month, who uh, came through the food pantry. So the food pantry continues to have a huge impact uh, in our community and beyond. So your giving helps to support uh, part of that. Your food pan your uh, giving also helps to support uh, our missionaries across the world and also Trail Life and American Heritage Girls, uh, those two troops right here in our local church. Those troops are taking a, a break this summer. Uh, continue to pray for leadership. We are, even though the kids aren't here, the leaders are still making plans and getting lesson plans and, and involvement and all kinds of things ready for next year. So uh, again, even though the kids aren't here on Sunday afternoons, uh, the leaders are still going. Those of you who have ever led or, or been in a, in a teaching situation know exactly what that's like. You don't get a break. You, you keep looking forward to what's coming up next year. So there you go. As always, you can find all these things and uh, keep in touch with the other Bethel Methodist churches around the state also at BethelMethodist.com. We're at slash Robinson. As we begin our service this morning, we turn our attention away from announcements and things coming up and, and ways to get involved in the ministries of our church, we turn our attention to the scriptures, Specif specifically this morning to Psalm 8. The psalmist writes these words, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Let us pray. Father, this morning as we begin this service, first we say thank you. Thank you that you are the God who creates. You are the God who, who calls, who invites us into relationship with yourself. You are the God who is actively involved in and with your creation today. Father, forgive us for those times when we fail to notice that. Forgive us, Lord God, for those times when we close our ears off to your voice, when we refuse to hear you and the voice of your spirit speak to our spirits. Father, forgive us for that. Forgive us for our stubbornness in wanting our way over your way. Father, today we tell you as we begin this service that we are here, and we ask you, Lord God, during this time, during this next hour together, speak to us. Open our ears that we might hear you. Soften our hearts toward you, Lord God, that we might be able to respond to you in love. 
and to listen and to respond to you, Lord God, in a way that pleases you and that makes you happy. Father, in all things today, in everything that you hear in this service, and all that goes on, no matter what we brought in with us, no matter what kinds of, of, uh, of issues or, or struggles that we've been through this past week, we thank you, Lord God, that you are able to bring us through all of those and that you are able, Lord God, to use us in whatever way that you need to today. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Let's stand together. We're going to sing For the Beauty of the Earth, hymn number 793. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise for the wonder of each hour of the day and of the night, hill and vale and tree and flower, sun and moon and stars of light. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise for the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above, for all gentle thoughts and mild. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise for the church that evermore Lift up holy hands above, offspring upon every shore, her pure sacrifice of love. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise for thyself, best gift divine, to our race so freely gave. For that great, great love of thine, peace on earth and joy of heaven. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. Let's go to Second Corinthians 13, 11 through 14. This is Paul's benediction concluding his second letter to the Corinthian church. Become complete, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let's sing hymn number 781, Face to Face. Face to face with Christ my Savior, face to face what will it be? When with rapture I behold Him, just Christ who died for me. Face to face I shall behold Him, far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all His glory. I shall see him by and by. Only faintly now I see him with the darkening veil below between. But with blessed day is coming when his holy girl be seen. Face to face I shall behold him far on the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory, I shall see him by and by. What rejoicing
rejoicing in his presence when our banished grief or pain when the crooked ways are straightened and the dark things shall be plain face to face i shall behold him far beyond the starry sky face to face in all his glory i shall see him by and by face to face oh blissful moment face to face to see and know face to face with my redeemer jesus christ who loves me so face to face i shall behold him fair upon the sorry sky face to face in all his glory i shall see him by and by let's remain standing for the apostles creed i believe in god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth and in jesus christ his only son our lord who was conceived by the holy spirit born of the virgin mary suffered under pontius pilate was crucified dead and buried the third day he rose from the dead he ascended into heaven and is sitting at the right hand of god the father almighty and from there he shall come to judge the living and the dead I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father. As we go to prayer for one another this morning, as I said earlier, there are a number of folks who, you'll notice, aren't with us this morning. I, I do, though, something was brought to my attention. I um, had a text from Sally this morning, and she said uh, she wanted to be here, but her, her chemo this week was, as she said, ugly. And that was with a, all caps, underlined, Sally was very <laughs> specific in her text that that was the issue. So uh, I told her this morning, we'll certainly be praying for you, we'll certainly remember you and what you're going through, and uh, we'll be praying, praying for you this morning. And she texted back and said, pray for Max also. And it reminded me that we have a number of folks. I started writing down Sally and Max Sally, who's been going through this, this long uh, process with her chemo and her cancer treatments and all those things, and then Max, who has come along and taking care of her and, and is taking her to treatments and, and coming home and being with her and, and helping her in so many ways. Um, I started thinking about all the folks that we have in our church who are doing that, who are caretakers for someone who's going through a long term kind of illness. I just, I know I'm going to miss somebody. If I started naming names, but I'm going to try it anyway. We have Sally and Max taking care of her. We have Donna and Bill taking care of her. We have Sherlon and Ed taking care of her. We have Bill and Loretta taking care of him. We have a, a, a little bit different scenario, but we have Mary Jane who's been sick. She's still recuperating from her fall and, and uh, um, the, the damage that she did to her leg. And her son Chuck, who's, uh, who's taking care of her, and another son who's coming in and, and helping as well. We have Judy and Jim. We have uh, Fred and Kim, also who aren't here this morning. We have uh, Alvin and uh, Alvin and Jim, and then Anne is having to take care of both her husband and her brother in that in that scenario. And I know, as I said, I know I missed somebody. Uh, well, the Flanses. We have Martin, who has been struggling with some, some health issues, and, and Kathleen, as, as she takes care of him. And Kathleen would say, and the other way around sometimes, too. 
So we have all of those situations going on. Um, often when we look around at our, at our church family, I, I'm not sure that, that I always remember, and I apologize as your pastor for doing this, I'm not sure that I always remember the caretakers who were involved in taking care of, of those folks who were going through such a long struggle. We remember to pray for the sick. We remember to pray for those who are, who are hurting and those who are in need of healing and, and support and comfort. But sometimes we, we just simply forget. It slips our mind to be praying for those caretakers until we're put in the position of being a caretaker. And then we ask all the time, please, please pray for me. So this morning as we go to prayer, we're absolutely going to be praying for that. We're going to be praying for our campers, for those who are going uh, as not only campers, but also as, uh, as staff this week. Certainly we're going to be doing that. But then also for all of those who are sick and those who are taking care of them this morning. Let us pray. Father, there's no way that we know or that we can remember all of the ways to pray for one another. But yet, Lord God, you still direct us to be in prayer always. That doesn't mean that we're constantly walking around with our eyes closed and our heads bowed, but it is an attitude, an attitude of going through life with, with the understanding that you are with us, with a willingness to respond to you in whatever way and, and however it is, Lord God, that you call us to remember those around us. This morning, Father, you've laid upon my heart these who are caretakers, not just those who are sick, as we usually are praying for during this time, but those who are also the caretakers and helping to care for in, in the best ways that they can. We ask, Father, that you will be with, with those who are sick this morning, who are going through these cancer treatments, who are preparing for surgeries, these who are, who are dealing with sometimes devastating, devastating illnesses in their lives. We thank you, Father, that you are with them. And we ask, Lord God, that you will encourage and bring your strength to them this morning. But we pray also this morning, Father, for those who are the caretakers, for husbands and wives, for sons and daughters who are, who are helping, who are dealing with um, the hurt and the pain, who are simply sometimes just being there to hold a hand. Whatever it is, however it is, Lord God, that you are laying upon these who are caretakers today, we ask, Father, that you will be with them, that you will continue to give them an extra measure of your grace. Father, we know that you have been doing this long before we've asked. You are aware of this need. But, Father, this morning we specifically remember these. We've named some. We know that there are probably others. And, Father, we ask today that you will be with these very specifically and encourage, strengthen, help these caretakers in every way possible. Father, we do pray for those who are going to camp today. We ask, Father, your traveling mercies. We pray that you will protect us while we're on the road, that you will help to get us safely from our church to camp today. We pray that not only for, for our group traveling, Father, but for, for those who are coming from, from all over the state, whether it's from uh, North Texas, whether it's from the Hill Country, whether it's from South Texas, wherever it is, Father, be with these folks, I ask. Help them. Keep them safe. We pray, Father, for, for your presence to already settle in upon that campground. Prepare us, Lord God, that we might hear your voice. Clean out our ears, Lord God, that we might be able to hear and to respond to you this week. I pray, Father, for these who are, who are not going to camp today, uh, who, are, who are going to be staying home this week to take care of the things that they need to take care of. We ask, Father, that you will encourage them, remind them, bring upon their minds and upon their hearts regularly this week to pray for us who are away. Father, in all things, we give you praise and glory. In all things, Lord God, we recognize that you are God alone. And we thank you, Father, for all of the ways that you call us to know you and to walk with you. Hear us now as we join our hearts and our voices together, praying as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I can't believe it hadn't been said yet this morning, but this is 
Trinity Sunday. The Sunday always following Pentecost is Trinity Sunday. You might have heard something along the lines of, of the Trinity, uh, God at work. One God, but at work in three different ways uh, in his creation and in his church. And uh, so uh, we're going to talk more about that as we get to the sermon this morning. But I want you this morning, as we get to the Gospel of Matthew for our reading this morning, I want you to hear the ways in which Jesus is completing his earthly mission and preparing to send the disciples out on the beginning of their earthly mission. For we're still a part of that mission that Jesus entrusted to all of us who are followers of him. Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen and amen. Let's sing again. Let's stand together and we'll sing, Go Make of All Disciples. Go make of all disciples, we hear the call, O Lord, that comes from you, our Father. Spirit from age to age the same. We tell each new disciple to follow you, our Lord, redeeming soul and body by water and word. Go make of all disciples. We ask. Until each life's completion exit your holy way, we cultivate the nature God plants in every heart, revealing on our witness the master teacher's heart. Go make of all desire. preparing to preach today and then to preach and teach at camp this week, several thoughts have run through my head. Uh, one thought had to do with uh, God's work of preparing witnesses to speak God's truth and to demonstrate the reality of God's presence and love to the world around us. And I think we, we read about that just now in the Great Commission, remembering again Jesus' call for his followers, for disciples to go and to take this message into the world. Um, this, this line of thinking applies to those who are going to camp and those who are not going to camp this week, doesn't it? it? It applies to everyone. God is preparing each of us 
to be witnesses, whether it's in our everyday life, whether it's in the in the person we, we talk to and the way we treat the lady at Walmart who's, who's checking out our, our, lug, our, not luggage, what's it called? Produce, whatever it is. You might be buying luggage. Who knows what you're buying at Walmart? I have no idea, and it doesn't really matter, does it? So the way that you treat the person at Walmart versus the way that you treat the person in your house, it shouldn't be a whole lot of difference. It should be the same. We are still being witnesses of God's love, of God's holy love to all of those who are around us. That was the first thought that kind of went through my head. The second thought dealt with God's work in preparing the minds and the spirits of campers this week to hear and to respond to what is being proclaimed about God. Again, that doesn't just apply to those who are going to camp. That applies to us as well, as in how do you prepare for worship? What do you do in your life to get you ready? Here, do you see Sunday as being different for God's people for centuries, uh, for the Jewish people still to this day. The Sabbath, the day of worship, was a day of rest, and we're going to read about that in just a few moments. But the Sabbath was a, was a particular day, a day that was set apart from all the others, a day, in which, a day which you didn't treat like you treated the other six days of the week because you recognized that that day was special. You did things differently. You, you, you prepared yourself differently. To, to stand before God's presence, to meet with God's people. It doesn't mean that you put on a mask and you prepared yourself to hide all of the, the, the troubles and all the, the things that you've been through that week. That's not what being God's people is about. It's about being willing to take off that mask. It's about will, being willing to confess to one another, I've struggled this week. It's about knowing that your church family loves you enough to come along beside you and wrap your arms around you when you're going through difficult times, when you're struggling through some sort of situation. These are things that we remember as we prepare for worship. But that's not the sermon for today either. God ended up taking my thinking down a different, a different path. And let me tell you what it was that reminded me of what we're going to be preaching about today. I think everyone who's been in junior camp for the last uh, 10 years, maybe longer, everyone who has served in junior camp has learned how important it is to make sure that our youngest campers, those who are from, what, like second grade, the end of second grade through sixth grade, in that, in that frame, basically, to make sure that these youngest campers have a good spiritual foundation in our lives. That used to not be an issue. When, when I first started going to camp, we had kids. Uh, mainly it was Cameron uh, from our church, and there were some others. Uh, you guys know who they were. Well, Tyler was there. You had, you had other folks who, you had kids who were, Jordan was there. Uh, you had kids who were coming to church, uh, who were coming to camp, who had been in church or Sunday school pretty much every week since the last year that camp rolled through. We don't have that anymore. The junior campers who we get often have no idea what we're talking about. When we start talking about a, a, a story in the Bible, uh, say, I'll throw one out, for example. We, we start, talking about, um, start talking about God giving Moses the Ten Commandments and, and coming down from These folks have no idea what you're talking about. First of all, who is Moses? Second of all, what are the Ten Commandments? Third of all, what is a Bible? What are you even talking about? That's, that's what we've discovered is happening in our junior camp. Those kids who are being exposed and they're supposed to have a little bit of a spiritual foundation, but who simply don't. For whatever reason, they just don't. Rachel told me many years ago about a particular Sunday morning that she was helping out in the church nursery. That morning, there were three kids in the nursery with her. There was a preschooler who was a regular attender at, at church. There were two older kids who were visiting church that particular Sunday morning with their parents. Uh, the three children were working on a puzzle together, and when they finished, Rachel asked, what is this picture of? The two older children seemed to have no foundation of biblical stories because they didn't know what the picture on the puzzle was. They had no idea.
It's just a puzzle. It was a picture of some guy. They didn't know who he was. The preschooler knew immediately. There was a boat. There were animals. There was a rainbow. This is part of Noah's story, Noah and the ark. The lack of, expo of exposure to the biblical stories at a young age leaves a gaping hole in people's lives. And that lack of foundation has been seen in many of our junior campers over the past few years. And part of our job, we who are going to be at camp this, this year, whether it's uh, junior camp where Pam and I will be, whether it's senior camp where, uh, and, and Rachel, Pam and Rachel and I are going to be in junior camp this year, whether it's senior camp where everybody else is going to be, or floating back and forth where Sam's going to be, wherever it is, part of our job is to proclaim these stories. To proclaim the reality of God at work in our world that these stories contain. And to tell and to remind and to let these children know that God loves them. This is part of what I'm asking you to pray for as I say, pray for us as we're going to camp this year. Continuing down this line of thinking, we this morning in this service are going back to the beginning. All the way back to Genesis chapter 1 and the account of God's work in creating. Is this basic? Yes, yes it is. It's the very beginning. It's where everything starts. Is it necessary? Absolutely. Without the understanding that God is at work in our world, people can be led to think that creation was just an accident. If that is true, if creation is only an accident, then people must also be cosmic accidents with little or no value. But God makes it clear that there are no accidents. Because this is a large section, we're going to divide it up into smaller pieces as we read. So follow along. Uh, we'll start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, usually I say, let's stop there. We're not going to do that this morning. We're going to go on. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. These are, to many of us, these are familiar words. But too often we fail to think of the scope of what these words mean. The word translated as created. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is a verb in past tense. And some of you right now are going, ooh, he's talking about English and grammar this morning. And the rest of you, I just lost because you tuned out. But, that word in the past tense, created, is in that. And it's in that sense. God created in the past. In other words, we could say in the past, God worked. And now that work is done. But there's another little Hebrew word in that sentence. In fact, it's in, it's in both of these verses. And it's a little Hebrew word that's, that's just, it's so tiny. It's not translated into English, mainly because English doesn't know what to do with this word. It's the word et. If you're reading it in Hebrew this morning, you're going, yep, there it is, right there, I see it. But if you're not reading it in Hebrew, you're missing out, because it's there, I promise you. That little Hebrew word signifies that God's activity in creation was done in the past, but God's work in creation continues to this very day. Another way to say that is God's involvement in creation is not left in the past. But God's activity in creation is ongoing and continuing even to this very moment. God's action of creation extends to everything, whether it's seen or unseen. I'm talking about atoms and molecules, quarks, germs, cells, viruses, as well as the processes that are involved in creation, like the process of cave formation, the process of climate fluctuations, the process of nuclear fission. All of those things are at work in our world. We might not understand it. We might not ha know how it works. But it's at work around us. It's not wrong to say that God who created in the past is still actively involved in the process of creating today. And especially actively involved in the area of creating an awareness of his presence in the lives of those who will listen, who will respond, and who will seek after him. As we said earlier, this is Trinity Sunday. So where in this passage is the Trinity? 
God is present, as always. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We heard that God's spirit, God's breath, the wind of God was hovering over or brooding over creation. But where is Jesus? Notice what happens in verse 3. God speaks. And it is through that creative word that creation is formed. The word of God, with a capital W, is Jesus. That word which the gospel writer John tells us took on flesh and dwelt among us. So where is Jesus? Jesus, the word of God, is the creative force behind all that happens through the rest of this chapter. Instead of reading all these verses, though, this morning, here's what we're going to do. We're going to focus on the activity of God speaking. And so I want you, we're going to pull out here. Every, there's a formula in all of this. There's about seven parts to every single day. But I want you specifically to hear this morning what God speaks. We start on day one. Genesis chapter one, starting in verse three. God said, let there be light. And there was light. Into the darkness that was there. Into the emptiness, God spoke. And he spoke light. He said, let there be light. Light for revealing. Light for understanding. Light for illumination of all things. And there was light. Day two, Genesis chapter one, verse six. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the water. That's a word that we just don't use near enough, firmament. In the midst of the waters, let it divide the waters from the waters. And so the idea of, if you think of the sky, it divided the waters above from the waters below. This was what the writer is talking about. There is an atmosphere, if we want to use those words. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. The first part of day three, chapter nine. I'm sorry, not chapter nine, verse nine. God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered into one place. That's everything around us. Oceans, seas, rivers, all of those kinds of things. Let those be gathered into one place. Let the dry land appear. And it was so. Interestingly enough, God speaks twice on day three. And he says again in verse 11, let the earth bring forth grass. So this dry land that has now appeared, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. So all kinds of vegetable life is created on day three, the second part of day three. Day four, starting in verse 14, then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and seasons, for days and years, to mark the passing of time. God is creating for us here time, essentially. Let them, verse 15, let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so it's interesting that the actual word for sun and moon are not used in this passage. I think the reason for that is that there were a lot of cultures who worship either the sun or worship the moon. But the Hebrew writer wanted to point out that it was not the sun who did the creating. The sun was part of creation. It was not the moon that needed to be worshipped because it also was part of the creation. God was the one who deserved to be worshipped and God alone because God was the one who created both the light during the day, and the light at night, whether it was the moon or the stars, the galaxies, the constellations, whatever it was, God had created and put in place all of these things. Day five, starting in verse 20. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures. Let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. And then God speaks again, but instead of a, a speaking of creation, and bringing something into, that, into this world that wasn't there before. It's a word of blessing. And so God blesses the animal life. God blessed them, all of the birds of the air, the, the, the animals on the, on, the, on the ground, all of the fish in the sea, all of the creatures in the sea. God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply upon the earth. 
And so God has put into place here the way for the sea animals, the, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea to not only to be there, but to continue to be there. Here's the continuation. Here's the process of continuation of creation that God has established right here, speaking this word of blessing upon these animals. Day six, first part of day six in verse 24, we read this. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind. Cattle, the creeping thing, the beast of the earth, each according to its own kind. This is everything. These are mammals, amphibians, reptiles, everything that you've ever learned in any level of biology class that you've ever taken. This is all of that stuff. Everything. Everything from the biggest elephant to the smallest flea. Even smaller than that. This is everything that lives upon the earth. God created. You say, oh, how could God do that? The same one who could speak and light divide the darkness is the same one who can do this. But God's not done on day six. That's the first part. The second time, notice he speaks twice on day three and twice on day six. Multiples of three. Huh, maybe that means something. And then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God creates humanity differently than God creates the cattle or the dogs or, or the amphibians or any of those other or, or any of those other groups. All of those other animals are important to God. But yet God does something unique with humanity. Let us make humanity in our own image. And in that moment, God said, This will be the one who cares for. That's what has dominion over means. That's what God shows throughout all of biblical history. Leaders are not there to destroy, even though that's often what they did with their power. Leaders are put into place by God to care for the people who God puts under them. We are to care for, to treat with respect, not to abuse and overuse, but to treat with respect all that God has given it to recognize that it is a blessing from God. But then also, there's another word of blessing here in verse 28. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Some will argue that's the only commandment of God that humanity has never failed to, to fulfill. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth. Every tree whose fruit, whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall all be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And so it was. In everything that God does, God is creating a boundaries and putting things in their proper place. Light from darkness, darkness from light if we want to get technical, if we want to get scientific there. He's separating those two. He's creating a boundary. Water from land, creating a boundary. Animals that swim in the sea, animals that fly in the air, creating a boundary. Animals that reproduce after its own kind. Food that reproduces after its own kind. Humanity that reproduces after its own kind. In all of these things, God is creating a boundary and bringing order from that which had previously been chaotic. We finish off the creation account with the seventh day. Chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Then the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Does that mean that God got tired? He rolled up his sleeves, he did a hard day's work, he got tired and needed a nap? No, it's not what it's talking about. It's talking about God set an example for us to follow. 
that there needs to be times of refreshing, times of resting, times of, of us taking a step back from the work world and saying, I need to recharge. And the way that we recharge, first of all, is this. We recharge by remembering that we are God's creation and that we are a part of God's creation. We take a step back from all of the other struggles and things and stuff that we have to do during the week. And we say today we are setting aside as a special day, a day of remembrance, a day of worship, a day of refreshing and renewal. That's what this day is. That's what this Sabbath day is for us as Christians. This Sunday, that's what this day is. Over the past two centuries, many scholars have tried to claim that this account of creation that we find in Genesis 1 and the beginning of Genesis 2 was a cleaned up copy of the creation accounts from the Babylonians. The problem with that is that the Babylonians wrote their story after the oldest Genesis accounts that we have. Others have argued that there's a whole lot of the Egyptian creation account, the Egyptian uh, myth of, of how creation was formed, and that that was the framework that was used by the biblical writer. A few names were changed to protect the innocent and to make it about God and not about Ra or anybody else. But again, there are too many differences between the two accounts. For example, in the Babylonian account, it's a great fish that the Babylonian god kills and subdues and then guts that fish and out of the parts that come out of that fish, all of creation is made. Creation is formed from something that was already there. In the Genesis account, we don't see that. We see God speaking in whatever it was now existing. He's not taking the guts from something and making land. He's not taking uh, something else that was washed up on the seashore or the primordial ocean and making something else. He's using what is not there. He's forming what is not there to make what now is there. What does make sense is this. God lays out for us that the force behind creation and the force still present in creation is God himself. Just as last week we saw that God was at the heart of Pentecost and the, and the creation, the formation of the church, so too is God at the heart of all creation. In the creation account, God demonstrates again his power to form and his power to transform. Like God's creation, there's order and form and purpose in this passage. Uh, we saw several times the symmetry. Ten times God speaks. Once each day, twice on the third and on the sixth day, and then two words of blessing. There's no magical incantation involved. There's no reusing of other materials like in the pagan accounts. God is fully in control. God is creating by the word proceeding from his mouth. Truly, God's sovereignty, God's power, God's love are on full display. Too often this passage gets read as a literal presentation of creation or used to refute an evolutionary view of creation. But the point of this chapter is far bigger and far more important than offering an alternative to a scientific explanation of how we got here. Science is the tool that can tell us how, but this passage tells us why. Boundaries are being drawn. Life is emerging and being cared for and provided for. Chaos does not rule the day. God is bringing order from chaos. Through the pen of the ancient writer, God is making sure we understand creation was not an accident, but a well-planned event that always points us back to God himself. As amazing, as imaginative and beautiful as God's creation is, God's creative love. Remember a while ago I said God's power, God's sovereignty, God's love are on full display. God's love is on display here in the creation of humanity, in the image of God. God did not make us to be puppets or slaves as the pagan accounts talk about their gods doing. Instead, God made humanity to be a reflection of himself. These human beings of flesh are spiritual beings as well. These humans differ from the animal world and that they are given the power and the freedom to choose to love God. That's a dangerous choice on God's part to give this power to choose because that power may be turned around to choose not to love God, not to hear his voice, not to respond to him. 
without the power of choice, humanity could never really love God or really love one another. Sin, which enters in into the world in chapter 3, sin has twisted the reflection of God in our lives so that when we are separated from Christ, all we want to do is to look at ourself, to please ourself, to think that we are the center of all creation and not God. Think about it. Sin tells us to tear down others so that we can make ourselves appear to be more built up and more important than those around us. Sin causes us to label others as inferior to ourselves or to think that we are competitors with others for God's approval and love. But in Christ, God reshapes. God transforms our minds and our wills. God gives us eyes to see the image of God, not only in ourselves, but in all of those who are around us. And as we see the image of God reflected in the lives of others, we start to understand why God calls us to be witnesses to the world. We, it starts to dawn on us in that moment that there are others out there who have never heard this basic fact that God loves them. God wants them to know that they can choose to love God also. The most basic of facts, the most basic part of Christianity is that God reached to humanity when humanity had no way to reach out to God. And that is what we see on display for us throughout the creation story and then following all the way through the rest of the Bible. This, mo this morning as we wrap up our service, we sing our final hymn together this morning, as we prepare to be sent out from this place with another word of blessing, consider these things. Consider the ways that God has been at work, that God has spoken through his word this morning. Consider the ways that God is getting you to listen today. Let's sing. Let's stand again. We'll sing hymn one, one, 147, How Great Thou Art. Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from the mountain and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. 
thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. My soul, my Savior, God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Let's pray. Father, we came in this morning asking you to be at work, to move among us, to, to remind us that you are speaking to us today. We've heard throughout the service, Father, that very truth, that you are desiring for us to listen, to hear, to respond as you speak. Father, help us. Give us the courage to hear your voice today, the wisdom, Lord God, to respond to your voice. Father, you've brought us in here. You've reminded us that we are needy people, needy for you in every part of our lives, needy, Father, because we live in a world that still bears the scars of sin. But, Father, we are also hopeful people because we recognize, Lord God, that through the cross of Jesus Christ, sin's power has been defeated, and that through that cross we can be made right and whole in the way that you intended for humanity to be in the first place. Not at war with one another, not fighting over and quarreling over petty little things, but living as images of you in this world. Caring for those around us. Loving as you love. Father, this is what we were made to be. Help us, Lord God, today to recognize that. Lord, as we walk with you through faith in Christ, may you use us as your witnesses. You send us out into this world. Work in us. Work through us, Lord God, that others may know. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.